This is The Meaningful Way. I'm your host, Luke Iorio. What lens do you see life through? All of our experiences form a lens through which we perceive, interact, and relate to ourselves and the world. Well, our guest today has spent considerable time looking through her lens, specifically a camera lens, filming and documenting extraordinary stories and people and their way of living and leading in this world. It's provided her not only some wonderful stories, but a truly diverse and intriguing perspective of how life unfolds for us all. And I am looking forward to how this conversation unfolds, starting right now. As president of Creative Strategies Media, a media consulting company, and Enlightened Media, a film production company, Dara Padwell Audek's genuine passion for telling impactful stories has taken her around the globe. In fact, her journey to understand and share the serenity of Himalayan culture took her to Bhutan in 2008 and led to the documentary Bhutan, A Kingdom of Happiness. Dara is also the creator of She's Got Grit, a digital series about female athletes with disabilities. As an educator, mentor, and dedicated lifelong learner, Dara has embraced her work as an adjunct professor in the School of Communication at American University, and she is a devoted teacher to young people and adults in a variety of non-university classrooms as well. At the heart of her pursuits, though, Dara coaches creative change makers and helps them discover their unique gifts and explore how to bring those gifts to fulfillment. Dara, I am very excited to have you on The Meaningful Way. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Luke. I'm excited to be here. Fantastic. So as I mentioned, everybody, you've spent quite a uh, good amount of time looking through your camera, camera lens. And uh, so what I didn't mention was that you know, you've, you've produced shows on uh, Discovery, HD Theater, The Science Channel, Animal Planet. Your work's been on CBS, ESPN, Fox, National Geographic. Uh, you've now opened your lens to this world that is called uh, coaching. Uh, I want to hear maybe a little bit of the background of, you know, where where did your journey start that ultimately led to just all of this uh, extraordinary work that you're doing in the world today? So it really started very young. Um, I have been storytelling from the time I can remember drawing stories before <laughs> I could write them, and then writing short stories from the time I learned how to write on a piece of paper. Um, later on in my kind of tween years, I wrote plays, and I cast them with people in the neighborhood or friends and put on plays. Um, and then when I was an undergraduate in uh, at the University of Maryland in College Park, I couldn't make up my mind between a theater major and a psychology major because I was very interested in storytelling, but I was also interested in the psychology of people and characters and what dra- draws people to who they are. So I studied both, and I ended up actually designing a – degree in individual studies with two majors. Hmm. Um, I remember as a young girl watching National Geographic Explorer with my parents and looking at the stories and saying to myself, I want to do that. Hmm. I want to be out there telling those stories. I want to connect with the world in this way. And I just kept envisioning it and envisioning it. And eventually I made it happen. So a a variety of things. At first, I guess I'm intrigued by, I think there's a lot of individuals that while we're younger are drawn into that idea of having those creative pursuits and uh, pursuing things that, that tap us into that side of who we are. And yet for one reason or another, we don't follow it. And I'm curious for you, what, what allows you to stay that course that you were obviously touched by so young? Um, I've always followed my intuition, but it's interesting because some of the interviews I've done over the years, I interviewed a very interesting uh, psychiatrist by the name of Dr. Stuart Brown, who has the National Institute for Play. Hmm. And one of the things that he says, and this is very true in my own life and I've seen it in other people, is that our play nature as young people is a key to our purpose. Hmm. And Somehow in our Western culture, more than any place, I've seen it more here than I've seen it in other cultures, and I've traveled around the world. We move our training, our belief system, our attitudes away from our heart-centered 
or intuition centered focus to more of a mind focus. Mm -hmm. So mindfulness is actually kind of a misnomer because mm -hmm. mindfulness is actually not about the mind. Mindfulness is about the present moment, which comes from a heart space. Um, but we move away from that because we are a very competitive society. We're a society that is geared around success and productivity. And we get away from our basic play nature. And I think that you can remember, even probably you as a kid, what was it that you loved to play when you were doing mm -hmm. you know, and when you were young? And... and those are the keys to our purpose. Now, and I'm not saying I, I did it perfectly, and I'm, I'm still <laughs> in my 50s, and I'm still working on it. I think it's a lifelong journey. But I think that when we trust that those things are real yeah. and we listen to it, it only takes us in a place that's actually toward our highest good. Mm. I absolutely love that connection to our play nature. That's really, truly a wonderful way of us kind of stripping away the uh, everything that we've picked up, the experiences, the masks, the filters that we've picked up as we've grown as adults, and to get back down to maybe the essence of, of what we truly enjoyed and what we connected to in the present moment when we were just kids. Uh, that's a, a great way of being able to look at it. And I guess I'm curious if I, if I hold that in one regard, and then go off of what you described, that there was something about the psychology and the characters, the archetypes that were emerging in the stories. I'm kind of intrigued a little bit about that as well in terms of what were you drawn to in those characters? And then we'll get into a little bit of the journey that you've you've traveled through Bhutan and all of these other places because I have a feeling that role of the developing character uh, is something that you've had illuminated to you in a lot of different ways through the, through the years. But I'm curious, what drew you in originally to the emergence of, of those different characters and archetypes? So, again, part of my play nature, you know, when I would write a play as a, as a young girl, and I started writing plays when I was about nine, um, I was really interested in, well, who are these people? And I would draw on some historical reading. I was an avid reader. I, I was one who locked myself in the bathroom and would read for four hours. Um, and I was really interested in, you know, what made somebody who they were? How did they think? What did they believe? What were they feeling? And I truly do believe this. Um, I believe that each of us is here for a purpose. And understanding our true nature is what gives us a sense of peace in that purpose. And so for me, it wasn't just about telling the stories of other people, but understanding other people, which eventually ended up leading me to coaching. Hmm. It's that, yeah, it's interesting. It's, it's not only the understanding we develop in ourselves, but that understanding that we develop of others that I, I can see where that level of, of empathy and connection would draw you in to filmmaking, right? To be able to tell the stories of all of these different characters and to help us relate uh, to other people in, in such different ways. And I guess I'm curious that as you, you travel down that path, you get drawn in to the Himalayan culture that brings you to Bhutan on the complete other side of the world. And it leads to this extraordinary documentary on a kingdom of happiness. And I'm just wondering if you could speak to first, I guess, what, what drew you to the Himalayan culture and how did that unfold in terms of becoming this, this documentary, uh, that's very well respected out there on Bhutan. So, it started actually with National Geographic. They were very kind to send me in 1997 to Nepal to live with a Sherpa family to document the other side of the story. I don't know if you remember John Krakauer's Into Thin Air. Mm. And, and what happened on that mountain was very tragic. Yeah. I was very curious about the Sherpas who had climbed or who were there supporting the climbers, the commercial climbers, and what did they think? And what did they feel and what did they believe? What was their side of the story? And my gut told me, because I knew a little bit about the Buddhist culture, was that they were probably very connected to the mountain and to the land and that they probably knew things about the mountain and the land that the Western climbers didn't. Um, but I wanted to hear it from them. So National Geographic kindly sent me and a colleague to 
Nepal, and we ended up living with a Sherpa family for a few weeks, which was, an, that's what actually changed me, was that living experience hmm. that got me to Bhutan. Um, but my intuition was right about it. So when we actually interviewed some of the Sherpas who'd been on that climb, they said things like, well, we prayed to the mountain gods that morning, and the mountain gods told us not to climb. And we told the Westerners and the climbers, the mountain god said, don't go. And the Westerners said, well, we paid all this money, we're going. Mm. And it was a really interesting moment for them where they were being paid as Sherpas to support the climbers. Yeah. Yet they knew from their beliefs and their heart and their whole way of being that it wasn't the thing to do. Mm-hmm. And for me, that was a very interesting metaphor for kind of what we've been talking about, yeah. um, which is when you know something deep inside you that's an intuition and you don't follow it, what happens? Yeah. It's, it's amazing how often I hear from some of our guests, but then also from some of our listeners about those moments uh, and the two sides of it, right, of when they've listened to their intuition and the extraordinary things that have opened up, uh, as well as the times that they have not listened to their intuition and obviously what unfolds uh, either in that moment or many, many, many years later when they begin to look back on on the path they didn't trust, uh, that they didn't follow. And I guess I'm curious that you know you, you just described uh, uh, what the, the, this different view and this different connection that, that the the Sherpas had within their environment. And you also mentioned that it was in that living experience that so uh, profoundly started to shift you, which then led to some of this, this, this future work. Uh, so I guess I'm curious to just before we move then to that future work, I'm curious, what are some of the other elements of what you learned and what you experienced uh, in living with those families for that time that introduced you to what I would imagine is a whole new way of living and being? It was, it was transformational. Um, first of all, I came with all my stuff, right? I had all my stuff. <laughs> I had so much stuff. <laughs> um, and they had very little. I mean, they live in a very modest house that's kind of an adobe structure and brick structure. Very, very little. Hardly any furniture. Everything is on the floor and um, no bathroom. Um, and I had all this stuff. <laughs> And I'm in their house and they gave me a room that they only had like three rooms. They gave me one of their rooms to stay in, which was like taking away a third of their living space. Mm. And I just started to observe some things and be in their environment. So one of the things I observed was, first of all, they had no stuff. And yet they seemed extremely happy and peaceful. They didn't care that they didn't have any stuff mm -hmm. because they were living in such deep connection to their family and to their neighbors and to their culture, their friends who would come over and share a meal, that the stuff was completely irrelevant. So I saw that. The other thing that I saw is because they uh, were Buddhist is every day a meditation and a prayer that would go on in the morning and would go on in the evening. It would go on every time they would eat food. Hmm. There was, instead of eating our food in like 15 minutes, which I sometimes tend to do <laughs> still, the, the eating of a meal would go on for sometimes two hours. Wow. Because everything was very mindful. Every bite of food was very mindful. The other thing that I noticed was they had a young child who was about a year old. This, this to me was mind blowing. Two parts of this. Number one was the way they fed him. So we would all sit on the floor or we would sit outside and he would come toddling over and take bites of food from the mother. <laughs> and so the meal was revolving around how long would it take him to eat? <laughs> Isn't that amazing? It is. <laughs> it wasn't like, hurry up and eat, because we got to go. It was, how long is it going to take Tenzin to eat his meal? So we're going to sit here for however long it takes and talk. <laughs> Isn't that, I mean, that's a whole culture of valuing children in a very different way. Yeah. And then one, the one thing that absolutely blew my mind um, and made me really question my own sense of belief and fear 
um, so they're climbers by nature, right? They, they learn how to climb very early because they climb these incredible altitudes. Mm-hmm. They're acclimated to that. So Tenzin was about a year. And he was just kind of toddling and crawling. And we were sitting outside eating one of these two-hour meals and <laughs> having a great time. And, and Tenzing started to climb the outside of the house. And he could do that because it's in a combination of like an adobe brick. So it has nubs, mm-hmm. you know, very textured. He started to climb the house to the top. Can you imagine watching your one <laughs> climb your house? Um, I... My mouth dropped open. I started to panic. And I turned to the mother and I said, what, 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 uh, stop him. And she looked at me and she said, what? And I said, he's going to kill himself. And she said, oh, no, he's learning how to climb. (laughs) And I had to sit there and absolutely swallow every bit of my panic and anxiety. Mm Mm-hmm from my lens Mm -hmm. and watch this kid climb to the top of the house while they applauded him. (laughs) He was, I think he was maybe 12 or 13 months old. Mm. Um, And then once he got up, they told him to come back down and he had to figure it out. (laughs) They didn't get up to intervene. Mm -hmm. They trusted that he wasn't going to fall. Mm -hmm. And I, then started a conversation with them that this would never happen in a Western household. Mm -hmm. That we have so many fears and and beliefs about danger. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, we don't look at it that way. And that's what shifted me. It was like, who are these people? Where are they coming from? How do they allow this to unfold in a way that doesn't make them panic? Mm. It really is. It's, it's an amazing perspective because I've had some of these conversations even of recent. You know, I, the, the image, I, I love that. The, the, the 12 or 13 month old that's climbing to the top of the house when we won't let our children stand on top of a chair. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. But it's this, this unbelievable tug that we feel as parents that we want to protect, but we want them to soar. And how do you build that? How do you move through and navigate it? And their perspective of how they're approaching that philosophically and, and in behavior, uh, you can tell the, the way that that would instill something very different in a child has got to be amazing to be able to see and witness. But for you to be able to be from across the world witnessing this as it's unfolding, uh, truly had to be an amazing experience. Well, at first, like I said, I was completely panicked and afraid. And then I realized, sure. wait a minute, I'm the outsider here. Yeah. What am I doing? Mm. I'm just reacting from what I was taught. Mm-hmm. What if I was taught something else? You know, that's interesting because it's it's the I think it's one of the things that we lose sight of so much is that, you know, to be that outsider in a strange land, right? To, to be able to place ourselves in those situations where we're exposed to something that is so new to us and so foreign to us, but to not jump in, not try to change them, but to sit back and to observe and to learn and to not judge. Uh, that's one of the gifts that, that you so obviously have based on, on who you are, let alone the perspective of filmmaking is that you're there through that lens and how much we all would be able to learn from exposing ourselves, even right now within our own country, uh, to be able to look at other perspectives and other sides and learn from them as opposed to judge and fight and resist and try to change them. Start with the understanding. Absolutely. And we need that now. We need that now. But it it really takes being able to, and and I think I'm very blessed. I know I'm very blessed. I think I know I'm very blessed. I mean, I've got a, a lifetime of, being able to see these other perspectives and, and uh, all over the world and, Mm -hmm. and having to say, you know, what's different is wonderful. Mm -hmm. Not what's Mm -hmm. different is, is frightening Mm -hmm. or what's different is wonderful. And it, it allows us to see parts of ourselves that we don't know about. I'm okay. I'm really glad that you just brought that up because I'm, it's, it's one of the things that's amazing to me is that when we begin to celebrate our differences, 
as opposed to use those differences from a place of fear. If we celebrate what those differences are, it introduces us to places within us that we did not recognize. And through celebrating those differences, we actually begin to find our commonality and what it is that we share. And it goes back to the storytelling. So that I have another mentor, also by the name of Dara. Uh, Dara Marks said to me once in a workshop, stories teach us how to live. Mm. Well, if you think about it, um, it's in our DNA that as we watch other people's transformation, it triggers something in us that says, wait a minute, I can do that, or I can be that, or I can feel that, or I have felt that. Mm -hmm. And so even extreme differences do that because mm -hmm. we're all part of the same fabric, which I believe we are. Mm -hmm. um, then there are aspects of other people that are part of us and it gives us a freedom if we can embrace it. Mm. You know, it's, it's, it's through all of those different stories when we can embrace them. It's, I mean, it's, it's the purpose of this show, of the meaningful way. It's the, all of the unique journeys that we're all on to ultimately find the universal truths that we all ultimately find, uh, at some point within our lives. And it's that story telling and story making and, and uh, being able to be within those moments and to learn and view and, and, and connect, uh, in those types of ways that open us up to all the different ways we can travel this journey. And at the same time, what it is that, that is actually common and universal among us. Uh, so let's, let's dive into two of these stories because the, the two things I referenced before was Bhutan and then, uh, your latest work with She's Got Grits. Uh, She's Got Grit. And so with Bhutan, uh, and for those that don't know, uh, Bhutan is a, is a country that in the first in the world that actually prioritized and supports public, social, and governmental policy to drive gross national happiness gross national happiness. And I'm curious if you could just share a bit of what you took away then from that Bhutan experience, the kind of the story of what it is that they're doing right now, because it's taking what sounds like was something personal within the home that you experienced within the Sherpas and within many Buddhist communities. And it's now looking to do that on a national scale. Tell exactly. us a little about that story. That's exactly right. So so I left Nepal and I said, okay, I want to know more about this culture. I started reading everything I could get my hands on um, about Buddhism, about Himalayan culture, about Sherpas, about everything. Um, one thing led to another, and I met someone who was actually working in Bhutan, which is sort of the center of this. And uh, it took me many years to get there. Um, I kept trying to get there. When I was at Discovery, I kept saying, let's do a documentary. I kept pitching things. Nothing was happening. And then finally, my contact in Bhutan, Sonam, there's lots of Sonams in Bhutan. Hmm. He, we Skyped or we called or whatever. And he, he said, you have to come now. And I said, well, why do I have to come now? And he said, we are coronating our fifth king. He's the youngest king in the world. You have to come and document this. So within a matter of like five months, I, I envisioned it and I just kept pitching it. I pitched it to Nat Geo. I pitched it to some investors and it kind of just all came together. Um, I raised the first money to go and National Geographic International said, okay, if you go and you start doing this, we'll, you know, we'll write you some letters so you get access and then come back and we'll co-produce with you. We'll be a collaboration partner with you. Mm -hmm. So I went, um, I took a team of people. We were there for about three weeks. We filmed the coronation. We traveled a bit. It takes a long time to get around there. So we didn't travel extensively. Um, cause the roads are mostly dirt roads. Um, but as we were filming, I mean, you, when you're there, okay, you're there for a coronation of a king, but it's not like any coronation of a king you will ever see in any other place. Mm -hmm. And then you can't help but start to understand, well, what's going on there, which is this whole concept of gross national happiness. So the fourth king, the father of the fifth king, wisely said that when he was asked at a press conference years before, you know, well, what are you measuring in your, your country? How do you measure your country's productivity? He said, well, we don't. We measure our country's gross national happiness. And he then started to work with his government, uh, his parliament, they got democracy. So now they have a constitutional monarchy there. Um, and they started actually creating a center 
for Bhutan Studies, a GNH Center, so they could start measuring what that looks like in nine dimensions. Um, and again, when you're there, you can't help but feel that that's what they're doing because they're looking at environment and sustainability and how it relates to the conservation of their whole world and the planet. Mm -hmm. They're looking at psychological well-being. They're looking at health. They're looking at education. They're looking at good governance. They're looking at cultural integrity. They're looking at um, relationships. They're looking at the whole being. Mm -hmm. So GNH is actually measuring well-being. And their belief system, which is Buddhist, is that everything is interdependent. And if you don't have well-being, you really can't have a productive society. Yeah. So, long story short, uh, we came back with a lot of footage, um, <laughs> sat down with Natural Ge Geographic. They were excited. And then the stock market crashed <laughs> right after we got back. And I got a phone call after we had been greenlit to say, we can't do this. It was kind of a sad day because um, we had come so far. Um, but then they also said, but you know what? You're the one who's raised the first money, so it's your footage. It's not ours. Do with it what you will. Mm -hmm. um, and we wish you the best because this is a great project. Um, we quickly regrouped and we created a short film that went to some film festivals yeah. with the hopes that we would raise enough money to then do kind of a full-blown extended version mm -hmm. one thing led to another i mean this is the way this has gone and, and i, I want to say something here because this is part of my own learning experience and and part of what i think happens to us as human beings is sometimes we get so attached to things yeah and our ego gets attached to things it has to look like this or we have to have <laughs> right um and it was painful for me to let that go. I, I really experienced depression because I wanted it to look like this, but it wasn't going to. And I had to work on that. I, I worked with some of my own coaches mm -hmm. who helped me understand that sometimes when you let it go, it comes to you the way it's supposed to be. It, that was a painful thing to do, but it, it, this is what's happened. So I, I let go of my ego of, okay, it has to look like this. Um, it went to film festivals. I started doing talks about it. Um, I got invited to the United Nations to the first Global Happiness Summit led by Bhutan, which we got to film world leaders and talk to them. I got invited to do a TEDx talk on my experience in Bhutan. <laughs> um, I got invited to Denmark to mm. a Danish Bhutanese film festival where I met Hans Vessing, who's been filming in Bhutan since the 60s. And a Bhutanese filmmaker, and we started working together. <laughs> um, so I never would have guessed that journey. I never would have thought that that's what would have happened, but this is what's happening. And then we just came back from the World Happiness Summit in Miami, mm -hmm. where we also got to interview some fantastic um, people there, including several world leaders. Yeah. And so the vision for this now is kind of uh, the Bhutan film as it exists in its present state, which is more like an introduction to GNH. Mm -hmm. And then a, a piece that we're working on, Hans and Funsak and I, that is an educational piece for children and mm. schools about how do you bring these concepts into a classroom? How do you teach it in your family? How do you live it? And then my vision now is more of a global conversation because it is starting to happen around the world in different countries. Mm -hmm. It's happening in Mexico. It's happening in Brazil. It's happening in France. It's happening in the UK. It's happening here. Mm -hmm. So what is the global conversation around a shift of a new economic paradigm that doesn't focus on GDP, but focuses on well-being? and how will that enhance productivity and how will that allow us to I don't want to necessarily say be happier, but be more content so that we can be more of who we are. 
Okay, so l- y- let me share a few things because this you you've had such an extraordinary journey with this. And for everybody, if if you want to see what what's going on here, it's Bhutan, a kingdom of happiness. You can you can find that online very easily. The the piece that I love that you're tying together here, which is so important for everybody to understand about this idea of happiness, is that happiness is a it's a play as a as a word. It's a placeholder. It's a moniker for something that's a lot deeper. And that idea that is, it's the whole being process to bring you to total well-being is really what this is about so that we create flourishing societies, uh, people and companies and cultures that thrive. Uh, that's the deeper part of this happiness conversation that is emerging right now, which is truly extraordinary. And I love the, the perspective that, that again, I don't want anybody to not, not walk away with, which is that when we get attached to the way that we want something to look, we close ourselves off to just amazing other possibilities and opportunities because we don't realize it can look different. So we stop looking for the other paths that are actually there. But as soon as we begin to have acceptance of this is just what is, and we begin to let go that it doesn't have to look a certain way, it doesn't have to be just this, it might be something else as well, we open ourselves up to so many other possibilities to start coming in and other doors that start to fly open. And that's what you've had happen. And as you said, it's what it's supposed to be. It's coming together at a time that this conversation couldn't have emerged at the scale that it's emerging at on a global level until now. So had it been produced and brought to culmination before now, it probably wouldn't be part of stirring the conversation the way that it's going to. Exactly. No, and, and, and it's also this lens, you know, when something doesn't go the way we want it to go or envision it, we think of it as a failure or we feel as a failure. What about the idea that with those failures, there's actually amazing opportunity yeah. if we just kind of let go of that ego piece of it, which mm-hmm. is hard to do. Absolutely. I mean, I'm it like it's, oh, yeah, okay, it's like, you know, eating an ice cream cone. It's not. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's one of the things, though. It, 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 when when we have, and it's some of the phrasing I've heard thrown around, if we learn how to fail fast and fail forward, uh, even though that that could be public at times, it allows us to keep growing and keep evolving that much more quickly. And it's like one way or the other, you're going to have to learn certain lessons along the way. So you might as well learn them fast and adjust to them as opposed to resist against them and try and force them out. And that's... A big piece of what you've described, at least on this part of the journey. Um, That's a great word, Luke, resistance. Um, mm-hmm. it, and we tend to really do that. And we do, we resist because of fear and we resist because of, you know, beliefs or whatever. But getting resistance out of the way is a great thing to focus on. Uh, it's something to tune into because resistance comes up in so many different ways for all of us. Um, and like you said, it could be fear, it could be control, it can be attachment, it can be any number of things. But when you sense that resistance, that's a good time to take a look in, you know, within uh, what's really going on. What am I actually resisting? Why am I resisting it? Uh, what other possibilities might be here? So I, I could I could continue to talk about the gross national happiness in Bhutan for a long time, but I, I do want to spend just a few minutes on She's Got Grit, because you've got another really, really amazing project going on right now. Uh, so we're switching from the land of Sherpas to the land of athletes. And the, this this, uh, this video series that you're producing is on female athletes with disabilities who are competing at the absolute highest of levels. And you called it She's Got Grit. So I guess maybe if you could share a bit of what do you mean by grit and why is this project so important right now? Okay. Um so I started this project actually with Trisha Downing, who is an athlete, female athlete with a disability. And we have been profiling many Paralympic athletes, as well as many up and coming Paralympians. So I, I just finished reading Angela Duckworth's book, mm-hmm. Grit. Um, and I agree with her. Grit is a combination of perseverance and passion. And you have to have them together. Um, if you don't have the passion, you won't be able to persevere. And if you don't have the perseverance, it, um, it's hard to make your passion come to life. So I agree with that in terms of a definition. It, it actually isn't completely unrelated to the happiness project mm-hmm. in the sense that um, I had been profiling athletes for many years when I started working with ESPN, before I worked with Geographic, and then later on, 
I've, I've always been involved in sports television in some way. Um, and I've always been fascinated by athletes because of their ability to be fully present in a moment when they're training and when they're competing. Um, and a few years ago, I did a series for ARP's Life to Reimagine project about people over the age of 45 who were reinventing themselves and trying to find their true purpose. And I did a profile of a guy by the name of Kirk Bauer, who now runs a, a Disabled Sports USA. Uh, Kirk had been injured in Vietnam. He lost his leg, and yet he learned how to ski hmm. and then founded this organization and uh, or co-founded, I think, and is now training other wounded warriors and other people with disabilities to basically transform their lives through sport. Mm. Um, and then I went to a seminar led by Gina Davis, who you know who she mm -hmm. is, and she was talking about the gaps in our media today about the portrayal of women yeah. and being unrealistic, being, you know, not human, not genuine, not real leaders. And so while I was interested in doing a series about athletes with disabilities, at first I was actually going to profile men and women. I decided that I wanted to put the focus on women and, and Trisha embraced that too. Um, and it also had, because I had heard something years ago on my happiness journey from the Dalai Lama that said, it's time for women to lead. Mm. So I said, well, I think it's time to really show how women do lead from a different lens, um, how creative, resourceful some women leaders really are, and also to unravel this myth that we have in our culture of disability, because I do believe it's a myth. Mm -hmm. I think that we have notions about what disability is that are not true. And I believe that all of us actually have disabilities. Mm -hmm. We all have them. Some of them are seen, some of them are unseen, but we all have things to overcome. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to know what can these women teach us about how do we live every day so that we do overcome so and not only overcome, but actually thrive. So I know that central to to the work that you're doing in the world now that kind of underrides the 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 filming and the documentaries and everything else that that sounds like it is clearly emerging through the work that you're doing with She's Got Grit is is authentic leadership. Yeah. And I was I was hoping you could speak to 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 that perspective on authentic leadership and exactly how it's just shining through with these beautiful human beings that you're profiling in She's Got Grit. So it goes back to listening to your intuition, um, following the things that feel like your purpose, um, and then having that grit, that passion and perseverance to put it together. So it's not just, well, I dream of doing this and I'm just going to like Mary Poppins snap my fingers and it's going to happen. It's I dream of doing it and I'm going to lay out a plan to get there. And I'm going to follow it and I'm going to practice mindfulness at a meditation or, or something every day so that I come from a place that I attract what I need to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that in every single case of these women who I've interviewed. We've now interviewed 20. Mm -hmm. uh, we have 10 episodes that have been produced on the website and on our YouTube channel. And um, we're... We're now in a stage where we're looking for partners uh, to get to the next level, but um, we have 10 more that are basically ready to be edited. But I found that in every single instance that they have a passion and they have the perseverance to lay out a plan to make it happen and they stay connected to themselves and to others in a way that it facilitates their dream. I don't know if I'm sense um <clears throat> so the authentic part of it is it's really heart driven mm -hmm. it's it's intuition and heart driven well i think it's it's in that intuition and heart driven as you described it's it's them connecting more so than ever to the kind of the essence of who they are and what they stand for and what their values are 
and the way in which that impacts the way they show up in the world, the way they make decisions, the way they relate. Uh, and it's, it sounds like, and even what I've seen within uh, these women that you've profiled is it exudes from them. I mean, it, it, they, they can't not lead that way because it's just genuinely who they are. Uh, and they're not holding it back the way that so many others do. And it's the disability that allowed them to get to that level. Mm-hmm. It was the disability in a way, and I think they every single one of them would say that their disability was a gift. Yeah. That even though it may be difficult at times, you know, because of myths in society and, and accessibility issues and things, that it's a gift that has taught them who they really are. So let's let's bring this to together now um, and kind of bring this uh, full circle. Um, name of the show is The Meaningful Way. And one of the things I love getting from our guests is their perspective on this and with your incredible uh, career and all of the different places you've traveled and all the different stories that you've had the chance to connect to and tell. I'm curious for you, what is it in life that taps you into a deeper, more meaningful way of living and being? Well, it sounds very simple and I'll elaborate on it, but for me, it's really the concept of love. Um, that, that love is a very, very strong and powerful driver for us as humans. And what happens if we embrace it in every part of our lives? So that's the first thing. And that means loving yourself. And so loving yourself is following your intuition, honoring your heart, treasuring your vessel, which is your body, treasuring your relationships and your connections and believing in the reality of purpose. Um, so it, it, love brings that faith that you can make a difference. You're here to make a difference and that you have a very special difference to make. Each one of us has a very unique and special difference to make. Mm. Dara, I want to thank you for dropping in on on the meaningful way and sharing all of the experiences and wisdom and stories that uh, that you've brought to us today. Uh, and I could tell you that I could I could keep talking and hearing uh, about more and more of these stories and, and insights for a long time. So, uh, as your continued projects move forward, I'm sure we'll have you back again to uh, share more with our audience. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. This was a lot of fun, and I I love talking to you. You're wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. For everybody, I really strongly encourage you to check out uh, Bhutan, A Kingdom of Happiness. Check out the latest series of She's Got Grit. Uh, these are really some just important stories and, and meaningful stories for you to be able to connect to, as well as see what's going on in, in different parts of the world. And so uh, there's a lot of takeaways from today. I love the idea of grit, uh, is that perseverance, that passion to be aware of how attached we get to different things because when we can accept what is and we can let go, new possibilities will open up for us. And I bring you back to the beginning of our conversation to reconnect to your play nature because it's in that play nature that you may just find a whole lot more purpose that's been hiding there for you for a very long time. And it's time to let it out and to start playing with it again. So as always, until next time, continue to enjoy the journey. Thanks for tuning in to The Meaningful Way. If you enjoyed this episode, do me a favor and please subscribe and follow along with all these great guests, their stories and interviews. Also, it helps us a lot if you not only share some of your favorite episodes online, but also provide us feedback. Go into iTunes, Stitcher, or whatever your favorite podcast app happens to be and rate the show. Provide us some feedback and let us know how it is that we're doing. If you want to learn more about what we're up to, whether it be with the IPEC Coach Training School, the Live, Lead, Play Network, or even just what's evolving with The Meaningful Way, go on and head on over to LukeIorio.com. Music.